Hi everyone, uh, this is Dr. Young. Um, uh, Jewish history. Uh, realize that the circumstances are not ideal here. Um, I'm going to do my best to create content for you uh, for the rest of the semester. Um, I'm still thinking through uh, requirements for the course and whether uh, we need to modify any of those. I imagine there will be some modifications, uh, but for now, uh, this is what we have. Uh, me talking to a screen here. Hopefully this comes to you in a format that is easily digestible. Uh, this video will actually be fairly short. I just want to finish up some points that we uh, had begun to make the last time we met um, uh, about Jews in modern Western Europe, specifically Western and Central Europe, uh, to be more precise. Um, I will then create another one about Eastern Europe, about Poland and Russia uh, in the 19th and early 20th centuries, actually going back to the 18th century, um, and uh, we'll move forward from there. Um, that second, or that, that next video will include a, a discussion about uh, Sholem Aleichem, uh, Tevi the Dairyman, which is, of course, a text that you're required to write a paper about. So when we last met, we were talking about this outgrowth in... Um, modern Europe, uh, the Jewish history in modern Europe of uh, an intense urbanization, uh, the growth in the 18th and 19th centuries of these uh, Jewish communities in urban spaces. Um, in London in the 18th and early 19th centuries, you know, the Jewish population reached something or something between 10 and 15,000. Uh, in Berlin, um, much larger than that, you know, 150, 200,000 Jews uh, lived in Berlin by the end of the 19th century. Prague had probably 50 or 60,000. Uh, Paris was in the tens of thousands. Vienna may have had the largest of all the Jewish populations in Europe, uh, though Budapest also had a, a significant, significant size, significantly sized community. Um, and it's in these urban spaces that a lot of uh, the creativity uh, of the Jews of Western Europe is found. Um, this is where they engage in a lot of uh, scholarship, and that's one of the main points that I want to make in this in this video. Um, but one of the things that I assigned you to read was the essay in the Biale book uh, about um, kind of these urban communities, um, and specifically about their programs of building synagogues. And you know, I could show you a whole set of slides uh, of these synagogues that are built uh, in this time. Uh, they often are built in a style that tries to imitate uh, the synagogue architecture of, uh, Sephar of, of the Sephardic communities rather than the Ashkenazic communities, uh, meaning that this is a distinctly kind of Spanish and Portuguese style rather than the, uh, the German, which really just imitates uh, the Christian architecture in Northern and Central Europe. Um, and so a couple of examples of this are the, the picture at the top here um, is of uh, the, the, the so-called Spanish synagogue in Prague. Um, and you can see the, um, well, the, the horseshoe or, yeah, yeah, I guess it's the just kind of the Roman arch there. Uh, but specifically the decoration uh, is very much reminiscent of the synagogue architecture of the Mediterranean and specifically Spain and North Africa and places like this. Uh, this the, the picture on the bottom here is of the Dohani Street Synagogue in Budapest. Um, and, you know, same, same sort of thing there. Um, the, the decor in particular is, again, reminiscent of Iberia. Um, and there's some other things about these specific synagogues and others like them that are built in this period that I want to talk about as we discuss Reform Judaism, but I'll, I'll come back to that point. Um, this is also the period where we see uh, the growth of a Jewish bourgeoisie uh, in these cities. And we talked about this last time, so I don't, I don't want to belabor the point, but this is the period of the Rothschilds and, and uh, other families like them. Um, who had a great deal of success in procuring goods and in, in, uh, um, establishing contracts with governments and uh, with major firms uh, and became some of the wealthiest uh, families in Europe at the time, uh, really indispensable to the economies uh, of modern Europe, right? Um, and uh, in Shulam Aleichem, for instance, you know, he talks about the Rothschilds uh, 
comparing himself at times to them. You know, it's all very, very well and good for the Rothschilds in Paris to be doing these things, but here I am, poor Tevya, uh, in Anatevka, in this, you know, tiny uh, shtetl um, in the Russian Pale of Settlement. Uh, you know, what, is, what do the Rothschilds have to do with me? What is their experience to me? It means nothing, right? Um, but in Western Europe, I mean, the Rothschilds and, and others were certainly to be looked up to and, and admired by many. Um, now, these are the points we really didn't, did not make it to in our class last time. Um, and I think I thought about getting into this, but I decided I couldn't do it in two minutes. Uh, the term Wissenschaft des Judentums, this is German, of course, um, it means the science of Judaism. Uh, this is an intellectual movement in starting in the early 19th century, but arguably the most important of all of the intellectual movements in Judaism in, in Western Europe. Um, and it goes hand in hand, at least to some extent, with the growth of what we call Reform Judaism. Um, though these are separate phenomena, and there is some tension between them. So let me deal with Wissenschaft first, and then I will come to Reform Judaism. Um, now, for this, we have to look more broadly uh, at the kind of the broader European context of the period. Uh, the late 18th and early 19th centuries witnessed what has been called the Second Scientific Revolution. The first scientific revolution, of course, was the work of people like John Locke and Robert Hooke and Isaac Newton in particular. Um, Galileo uh, was an early kind of figure in this, of course, and it's, you know, centered on an understanding, an exploration and understanding of the laws of physics, things that govern motion in the universe uh, and all of that, right? This is, um, and uh, challenged the prevailing notions of things like, well, the Ptolemaic model of the universe where the earth was at the center and the sun and other heavenly bodies revolved around the earth, um, that there was a fundamental difference between uh, the, uh, the earth and the bodies uh, uh, in motion above the earth. Um, well, Newton in particular uh, dealt a death blow to that notion um, uh, in formulating the laws of motion and, and uh, the theory of gravitation. Um, and, you know, these are, these are things that fundamentally change the way that we understand the, the whole universe, right? Well, that is followed roughly a hundred years after Newton, you know, was really making his most important discoveries uh, by a whole raft of scientific explorations, experiments, discoveries, uh, and the establishment of a number of theories, right? Um, and the second scientific, scientific revolution um, begins traditionally with the voyage of uh, Captain Cook in the late 1760s and ends with the voyage of the HMS Beagle with Charles Darwin aboard in the 1830s and with the eventual publication only 25, 30 years later of The Origin of Species. Um, and even though there were some significant discoveries about astronomy and about uh, Really, it was in the second scientific revolution that um, the the understanding of deep space, uh, the size of the universe and all of that uh, became known, especially through the work of the German slash English astronomer William Herschel. Um, but maybe more importantly, uh, in the second scientific revolution were the discoveries of, well, uh, certain people leading up to, but especially uh, Charles Darwin, right, where we have this notion of deep time. Um, uh, that is that the, the world is, is very old. Um, the universe itself is very old. That this does not begin a few thousand years before Christ with, uh, with creation and, the, you know, the, this whole notion of the earth being only a few thousand years old. Um, but the, the Earth is millions or even billions of years old, and uh, the fossil evidence, uh, the English scientist Liddell, um, for instance, and uh, you know, discovering fossils and working on these things, and then especially Darwin, who you know begins to understand uh, this process of evolution, right, or natural selection, um, and it's with this 
second scientific revolution that a number of things happened that, that impinge upon the story of Judaism. Uh, we will talk about the application of Darwin's theories to uh, the creation of scientific racism and uh, the manifestation of modern anti-Semitism um, in, uh, well, later on uh, in this course, actually, that'll be the lecture after next um, that we'll do that. Um, but uh, another way that the Second Scientific Revolution uh, bears fruit for, or rather impinges on the story of modern Judaism, is that it creates this idea that science, and in fact the term science itself is coined as we know it now, at the beginning of the 19th century during this, this whole sequence of events. Science replaces earlier religious notions for explaining how the world and how the universe works, right? Now, this doesn't entirely do away with religious notions, but the idea is even there that, you know, God works through scientific processes, right? That he is the author of science. At least some people uh, start to argue for that notion. Um, and this is where we see the creation of these learned societies. Now, there, there were a lot of these previous to this time. Uh, there's this thing called the Royal Society in England, starting in the late 17th century. Um, but uh, this proliferates in Europe. Um, this is still actually something that we find in European universities today. Uh, we find these societies for the study of such and such, and often research institutes for the study of you know, specific subjects, right? That's an outgrowth of this whole period of the Wissenschaft movements, uh, Wissenschaft is German for science, the scientific movements of the second scientific revolution, right? Now, one of these, uh, an outgrowth of this is actually a transformation of history from something that was kept largely by, um, well, by religious communities. Um, you know, the, the History writing in the Middle Ages, for instance, was done by mostly by monks um, and by rabbis in the Jewish tradition, right? Um, and uh, history was there to demonstrate the, you know, the workings of God in the world um, and the truth of one's religious viewpoint and all of that. Uh, history was not done simply for the sake of understanding how things happened. Well, in the early 19th century, um, thinkers began to apply the principles of science, that is objectivity, to the study of human history and to the study of human societies, which is where we get the outgrowth of things like, well, the social sciences, right? Uh, sociology, anthropology, uh, even later on psychology, right? These are, these are the applications of the notion of science to the study of human behavior. Um, but it's in Germany that this happens for history, right? Um, the, uh, the, the godfather of modern historical thinking, Leopold von Ranke, uh, wrote that history ought not to be done um, to prove one's own subjective viewpoint, but rather in the German, wie es eigentlich gewesen ist, uh, as it actually happened. Um, the, the goal of the historian is to be objective and simply to understand how things really happened and that the, uh, the, the data... Um, that is, the, the material for observation were written documents that were found in archives. Okay. Well, all of that is kind of swirling around. Um, the, the growth of academic history, uh, this notion that science could, the principles of science, the, the, especially the goal of objectivity, could be applied to the study of human behavior. And there are certain Jewish intellectuals in the early 19th century, most of them were rabbis, who began to adopt this approach to the study of Judaism. Now, the most important of these, or the founder of this whole school, is a German rabbi named Leopold Zunz. That's Z-U-N-Z, -Z, uh, for those keeping track. I haven't written his name here. I probably should have. Um, but he founds a and again, this, is, this tends to be the way things, things happen, uh, together with a few other intellectuals, founds a society called, um, in the German, Verein für, für Kultur und Wissenschaft der Juden. Uh, translated, that would be the Society for the Culture and Science of the Jews. 
And this publishes a journal, an academic journal called the Zeitschrift, um, uh, which is just German for journal. The Zeitschrift, actually, it means something different, but let's not go into the nuances of that. Zeitschrift for, uh, für uh, die Wissenschaft des Judentums, right? The Journal for the Science of Judaism. And this is an important moment for Jewish intellectual history, right? Because these rabbis applying the principles of science are to some extent saying that, well, they're challenging the notion that the Judaism that exists during their time is this timeless thing that goes all the way back to the revelation of God to Moses on Mount Sinai. This notion that there is a written law and an oral law, but all of that is contained within the theophany of Sinai, that this was in the mind of God, and that this is an unchanging thing that uh, the authority of which cannot be challenged. These scholars in the Wissenschaft movement say, no, let's look at this thing historically. Let's, let's uh, examine, for instance, the development of the doctrines and practices and especially the, the rituals, the liturgy of Judaism, and see how it's changed over time. Now, Zunz in particular, even though he was a rabbi, um, adopted almost entirely this scientific approach, not even for the sake of coming up with a better way to practice Judaism, uh, a more authentic or more palatable way that was, you know, responding to, to kind of modern influences. Uh, his approach was almost entirely scientific. That is, we want to, you know, just study this thing to understand it on its own, uh, on its own terms, uh, objectively, rather than because we want to you know, be better Jews, right? Um, but there were those who took this same kind of approach and said, well, if this was really the result of a, a, a set of historical developments, if things like the oral law were added, in other words, to the core of ancient Judaism, in other words, if the Talmud is potentially superfluous, well, and, and things even like uh, Hebrew as, as the sacred language, right? Um, if that could be not dispensed with, but rather for the sake of um, being more accessible, if some of these things could be de-emphasized, um, now that we understand the historical trajectory, in other words, uh, maybe this will lead us to a different approach to Judaism, uh, to the practice of Judaism. And it's here that we get this thing called Reform Judaism. Now, there's some other things going on here, okay? Uh, Reform Judaism was looking at um, the difference between, say, Catholic practice and Protestant practice within Christianity. And Reform was more interested in the way that Protestants were doing things. Now, this is happening in Northern Europe, primarily in places like Hamburg uh, and Berlin, where Protestant Christianity was much uh, stronger than in, say, Southern Germany or in Austria, or especially down in the Mediterranean, where Catholic Christianity uh, was still the, uh, the dominant force, the dominant cultural force in Europe. Um, the Protestants had done away with the, in, the kind of elaborate liturgy of Catholicism. Um, and there's a whole spectrum of that that we don't need to get into. The, the Lutherans were really more like Catholics in many ways. Um, but, uh, and especially things like the use of Latin uh, in the liturgy. Um, and we're instead doing services in the vernacular language. And for, you know, this, this place we're talking about, it's, it's mostly German. Um, and these reform rabbis, especially Abraham Geiger, uh, who was an associate of Leopold Zunz uh, and Heinrich Heine and some of these other figures in the Wissenschaft movement, um, Geiger and others like him began to come up with a different practice of Judaism. The liturgy was modified. 
um, in a number of ways. Uh, I mean, it, this is really kind of a fundamental rethinking of how Judaism ought to be done in terms of worship. Um, not just the use of the vernacular language, though that was important, but even the whole shape of the liturgy, right? Instead of having, and, and this still exists to some extent, instead of having, you know, uh, a rabbi who would read the sacred text and a cantor who would, you know, chant it, um, and uh, a, a room where there was a, um, well, the bima, that is the, you know, the, the pulpit where the, uh, the Torah scroll was laid out in the middle of everyone and everyone sits around the edges of the room. Um, and the ones, you know, who are the most prominent in the community would sit next to the ark. And I really wish I could be present to draw a diagram of this, but the ark is the, the uh, kind of container of the Torah scrolls. Uh, instead, the reform approach was to do uh, something more akin to what they saw in Protestant Christianity, that is to create a space where men and women would sit together in pews. Um, in the traditional practice of Judaism, men and women were separated during the liturgy. Women were uh, sort of cordoned off in a, in a separate space, usually behind the main hall in the synagogue. Uh, and maybe even, there may have even, there, there often was, I should say, a screen blocking the men from being able to see the women. Uh, women could look through a hole uh, that was focused on the Ark and on the Torah scroll, so that was still kind of an object of veneration and all of that. Well, Reform Judaism, you know, puts families together in pews and has them praying in German and has the rabbi offering a sermon uh, rather than simply reading from, you know, the uh, reading from the Torah and... Uh, Maybe, maybe reading from commentaries and things like this. Um, and, you know, I, I would be happy, uh, certainly, you know, if we, circumstances were different, to uh, encourage you to, you know, go check out uh, uh, some different uh, synagogues and, and, you know, see how the practice is done in an ortho orthodox synagogue versus a conservative synagogue versus a, a reform synagogue, but since uh, during the coronavirus uh, the pandemic here, we are cut off from, you know, meetings like this uh, largely. I don't think that's going to be possible, uh, but, you know, those of you who are familiar with this may know what I'm talking about. Um, and so if we look at these two synagogues, these are both synagogues in the reform tradition. Um, if you look at the Dohani Street Synagogue in the bottom picture in Budapest there, and this is um, kind of a Hungarian form. It's called Neolog Judaism, uh, but it's really in the Reform tradition. You'll see that there are pews there, right? Um, and I wish I could show you an Orthodox synagogue uh, to compare with this, but it's very different in the way it's laid out. Um, this would have been the same for the Spanish synagogue, by the way, in Prague, which is the picture on the top there. But this has now been turned into a museum. It's no longer a functioning synagogue. Um, that's why they have all of these case displays around the edges of it. But the thing that I'll have you note in the Spanish synagogue there is at the upper right, there's an organ, a pipe organ. And you can see this uh, behind the ark um, in the Dohani Street synagogue as well. You can see the pipes of an organ there. Uh, congregational singing. This is something wholly new in the Reformed tradition, uh, really an imitation of kind of Protestant Christianity, that there would be breaks in the services where the whole congregation would sing a hymn that was accompanied by an organ uh, and maybe other musical instruments. This is not something that would have happened in traditional synagogues where the cantor is the one who supplies the music. And it's it's done uh, for the most part a cappella, except maybe on Purim or something when there may have been musical instruments uh, involved. Okay, So the liturgy changes rapidly. And again, some of this is a response to these scholars like Zunz in the, in the Wissenschaft movement studying this stuff and saying, well, this hasn't always been the way we've done things, and you know, there have been a lot of modifications of this. Um, and so uh, you know, these things go hand in hand. Now, there are reactions against this. Um, Orthodox Judaism, as it comes to be called, which is really just a kind of outgrowth of the traditional way Judaism was practiced and, and worship services were held, uh, Orthodox Judaism is a reaction against reform, though it's a much like the, I mean, if I can, can be permitted an analogy, much like the 
kind of the Catholic Reformation response to the Protestant Reformation and Christianity by more or less doubling down on the uh, the traditional practices on the way that uh, the belief system and the liturgy and all of that that's what Orthodox Judaism does and this is led by uh, a group of rabbis again in in northern and, and central Europe in Germany for the most part um, who continue to insist on the primacy of Hebrew on the centrality of the Talmud um, on uh, traditional practice, the, the, the layout of the synagogues and the, the way that these things are done, the reading of the Torah, the observance of the traditional feasts with uh, Hebrew liturgy and all of that, right? Um, the leading rabbi and the orthodox kind of reaction is Samson Raphael Hirsch, um, who is a contemporary of Geiger. Um, and then there's also this kind of middle ground in Germany um, that gets staked out by Rabbi Zacharias Frankel, um, uh, where Frankel doesn't, he follows the reform movement in rejecting the kind of literal truth of the traditional religious doctrine and practice, that this is a, a timeless thing, that this has always been there. He's, you know, he follows the Wissenschaft scholars in, in saying, well, this is, I mean, you know, Judaism is something that has developed and, you know, may continue to develop. But he, you know, continues to hold with the, the notion that Israel is a divine thing, right? That there is something about the traditional rituals, especially the talk about Israel um, uh, as, the, as the chosen people historically, um, and all of that. And, and reform, you know, some parts of reform uh, do sort of believe that, but there's a, a kind of distancing and almost an assimilationist stance, at least culturally assimilationist stance, uh, with the, um, with reform Judaism, right? Uh, conservative um, uh, continues to, you know, hold to those traditional things on the basis of that the, these are the things that make Judaism distinct, um, and, and make them the chosen people of God, right? Uh, um, reform is more comfortable in saying, well, it doesn't really matter how we worship. We need to be able to respond to uh, mo the changes in modern times um, to make this more accessible to people that the essence of Judaism, in other words, is not the way that we have always done things, right? It's, uh, it, it's these other notions. Uh, it's the, you know, the Torah and... Um, and a belief in God and uh, things like this, right, that are important. Um, uh, so Orthodox, you know, doubles down on this conservative charts out of middle ground. Um, if that's confusing, I apologize. The, maybe the best way that I've, you know, explain or I've, I've seen this explained is, um, you know, an Orthodox person would, uh, you know, continue to dress in a, in a uh, very, traditional manner um would you know go to synagogue and and uh um participate in the traditional rituals would be very strict in keeping uh kosher laws and uh, all of the provisions of the torah as interpreted through the talmud uh would hold that the talmud is of equal authority and that the oral law and the written law are kind of one in the same or, or rather they're they're all one uh in the revelation of uh Moses on Sinai uh, a conservative would say well you know maybe some of this is additional um or this isn't original um and that there is a kind of core of Judaism in the written law the oral law is is necessary but there's still something distinctive about this, and we need to keep with these laws because it makes us who we are. Uh, whereas a Reformed Jew would say, well, some of this can go, right? Um, some of these traditional practices can go. We don't have to have our services in Hebrew. Um, a Reformed Jew might even say, it's okay if I, you know, break the kosher laws. I might feel bad about it, but, you know, it's um, eating pork or something like that, right? I don't have to be so strict in my observance of that because this is not fundamentally what it means to be a Jew. Um, uh, so and there, there may be some who would uh, uh, disagree with that characterization, but uh, that's the best I can do at this point. I, I will say the conservative um, movement is not something that really catches on in Europe. Uh, it does become very important, though, in the Jewish communities in the United States uh, in the 19th and early 20th centuries. And uh, 
has flourished there more than any other. Okay, so that's uh, the that's this lecture just to kind of wrap up some points that uh, we were making before the break. Um, and I will prepare one then on, um, the next one will be on uh, Jews in, in Poland and Russia, the, the Eastern European Ashkenazic situation. Um, and uh, included in that will be a discussion of uh, Sholem Aleichem, the assigned text. Um, I am creating discussion boards, and so please feel free to uh, ask any questions you have on the discussion boards uh, and to enter into discussion about any of these issues.